we had to rake out mortar joints in a wall. I forgot to do that and we were having dinner and he's like, no, you didn't forget. You just haven't done it yet. Oh no, you're going to go back and do it. I'm like, no, I'm not. He's like, boy, you're fired. I thought he was kidding. So I just went to sleep. Put that coffee down. Creators are leaders. Be careful what kind of leaders you're producing here. Helen, we're both in sales. Let me tell you why I suck as a salesman. They realized that to be in power, you didn't need guns or money or even numbers. You just needed the will to do what the other guy wouldn't. I'm not leaving. The show goes on. Well, hello there, friend. Welcome back to the Construction Leadership Podcast. I am your host, Bradley Hartman. Every now and then, we have a guest who comes on the show, and despite the research that we've done and the questions that we go over, we have a plan for what we're going to talk about. And then we meet, and all of that goes directly out the window, and it just feels like I'm talking to an old friend. This is what happened here with my new friend, Mr. Matt Debarra. He's the CEO and owner of Debarra Masonry in Los Angeles, California, and the CEO of the Contractor Consultants. So Matt was raised in the industry, fourth generation Mason, first day on the job. He was nine years old in the great state of Massachusetts. Fairly certain that is illegal, my friends. You cannot put nine-year-olds to work. What is this, some 18th century textile mill outside of Boston? You can't put kids to work. And yet, Matt did. He started learning at nine and has continuously worked at Debarra Masonry. Matt tells a great story about landing a $280,000 job through an internet lead that his father didn't believe in while he was going to school at the University of Massachusetts. Amherst mascot is, that's right, the Minutemen. Upon graduation, started working full-time with his father, and from 2015 to 2019, they grew the business nearly five times, and then Matt said, we got the recipe, and I'm sick of the cold. So he moved the whole operation. When I say the whole operation, I mean him and his recipe for success to Los Angeles and has built his company out there. You will hear a boatload of insights from Matt about change management, on introducing technology, about taking control of the customer, not being pushed around on price, about diversifying the customer base that you have. And one of the most ingenious celebratory rewards program I have ever heard that involves, among other things, a rubber chicken. You're going to hear all of this and more. You, my friends, are in for a treat. I really enjoyed talking to Matt. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Mr. Matt Debarra, owner of Debarra Masonry and the Contractor Consultants. As always, thank you for listening. Matt Debarra, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. You got it, man. You're you're a pro. I listened to like several other podcast episodes that you were on, and every one of them, I learned something and picked up something new. So I was really excited, and uh, thanks for making time. Glad you're here. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's a trial by fire. Yeah. <laughs> so let's start right there. Let's start with fire. You had mentioned family business. You got to perform. Said you were fired three times by your own family business. Just curious, what ages were those? Because if that was all like in like a 90-day period, that would be crazy. <laughs> um, thankfully, I learned. Um, <laughs> I, I think I was deserving of two of them. One that was probably my dad having a bad day. Um, and one, when I was like 15, 16, it was early. Okay. I had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. I was trying to come in as the boss's son, right? And that was yep. a little bit. The, the picking up trash and like being the bottom on the totem pole type thing was good for the first couple months, but so that was one and then taught me respect, right? And it was like, this is how it's going to be. Okay. Um, second one, I didn't, I didn't, uh, we had to rake out mortar joints in a wall and uh, I forgot to do that. And we were having dinner and my dad, we were talking about the day and he's like, no, you didn't forget. You just haven't done it yet. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, oh no, you're going to go back and do it. I'm like, no, I'm not. He's like, or oh, you're fired. I thought he was kidding. So I just went to sleep that night and I was the next day he was gone like four o'clock, four thirty, and I was at home. So that was the second one. And then the third one was later, I was probably 20 and 
you know, he was, I think, having a rough day. But yeah, three times. To clarify, his expectation was, oh, after dinner, you are going out in the dark and you will finish that job today. Oh, 100%. Well, I forgot to rake out the mortar joints and they were going to get hard. Oh, you have yeah, to go yeah. and hammer and chisel it out. So he's like, you can do it now. Or he's like, tomorrow it's going to be a nightmare. And I was like, I'll just do it tomorrow. And he's like, no, you need to do it tonight. And I just, yeah, I didn't do it. So <laughs> I learned that. I often think about this. And uh, so I grew up in lumber building materials and construction because my old man did. Love the guy, obviously. Could never, ever work together. And I'm always kind of curious about fathers and mothers and their, and their you know, daughters and sons that are in the business and what they take away from it. As you look at some of the, the key lessons, the key leadership lessons that you picked up from your dad over the years, what comes to mind that you say, oh man, well, whether I think about it, I, I got this from him and just you know, being on the job site since you were nine, you just soaked it up. What stands out to you that was most impactful in your leadership style? The biggest thing was just the structure of it. And what I mean by that is the fact that my dad could do something that a leadership style that maybe didn't work the best, right? He would do something and then he'd leave. And then the crew would complain the rest of the day about what he did. So I got to live in two worlds. I got to live with all the stress and struggle my dad had and going you know, at night and like having to write up contracts. And I got to see all of that. And then I also got to see the crew and, you know, if my dad got frustrated because he was more old school and if he got annoyed or something, or maybe he yelled, lost his temper, was like, this is, I can't believe you did this guy. And he would just leave, you know? And the guys would be like, man, your daddy, like, and they would complain for the next two hours. And I'm like, that doesn't work. So I learned by the structure of being able to see, and then there would be times where my dad would do things. He'd pull someone aside and I'd be like, I don't know what he said. I'm going to ask him tonight. But like that changed how he worked for the next month. And so I could see the, you know, I could see both sides of the coin. And that really helped me because I, it was like understanding what he did that had good impact. And I could always see what he did that maybe didn't work. Sounds like just a fantastic laboratory, right? Where you can see like, my gosh, he just gave this guy a little bit of encouragement. This guy was on fire and probably was doing 20 or 25% more in terms of productivity. Also, the way we approached, you know, the morning huddle and getting the work started, these guys were bitching about it for the next two hours. We probably lost 20% of the day based on that one interaction that happened at 5.30 in the morning. I can only imagine seeing both those sides was just fascinating. And probably, did you find that over time, the experiences that you had and what you saw made more sense as you got older? It was kind of like a curve. I think it was, I'd go through peaks and valleys where it okay. was like things would make sense and I'd break through a level of learning or knowing. And then I'd be like, gosh, I really don't know. And then I'd learn and understand again. So it was kind of these, these peaks and valleys. But yeah, I definitely, things started to connect more. M my dad didn't say a lot of what he was doing. My dad was a doer. He'd be like, move this over here, then do this, then do that. And I'm like, why over there and not here? And so it took me many years to really understand like how he would schedule projects and balance crews and why he would say certain things to owners. Like connecting all the, it wasn't until I could connect everything. I was probably mm -hmm. around like 18, 19 when I was running, you know, three crews and we were doing government jobs and I was doing commercials, like, you know, I'd stop at three or four projects, meet with site supers, owner reps meet, like I was doing all that at 18, 19. So that's when it all kind of came together for me. So tell me about this decision to say, Hey, this is working. We got a good little recipe going in here. We're on the East coast. I'm going to take the recipe. I'm not going to take any of the talent other than yourself and you were going to go to the opposite coast in California where you didn't know anybody and set up shop. Tell me about that decision and maybe that process and that time of your life. So it, there was a little bit of lead up. So I was working with my dad and I grew, we grew the company. So from about 15 to about 19, we grew the company about four, four and a half times. I mean, we wow. like really, we were hitting government work, prevailing wage work. We we're doing post offices and you know, it was really impressive to see the company grow. And that's a huge testament to what my dad and what they had built. They had that foundation already there, but I brought a new sense of, you know, the computers and technology. And I wanted to really kind of elevate the brand. And, and that's when it took place. We started to struggle a little bit though, 17, 18, 19. It was like, Hey dad, am I going to take this thing over? Right. Are you going to step aside? What's going to happen? And so to make a long story short, there was a time where I saw, you're going back now, I think 14, 15 years, but I was starting to see the internet become a big thing and websites and all of that. And I said, you know, we really have to get on these bid platforms and advertise and just really shift the business. And he's like, Matt, 
we're doing public work based on the bid requests. He's like, we're doing a ton of word of mouth. We're in with all these GCs. He didn't want to do these lead platforms that it like it was like Angie's List and Home Advisor and Service Magic, like all these old school platforms for the residential division. And so we butted heads and I was in college and I was and he's like said, if you think you can do better, just do it yourself. He's like, work for me, do the bids. He's like, but you know, you're in school, go ahead. So I got licensed in school, bought a pickup truck and started going to appointments on nights and weekends. And I ended up growing this company. I was doing foundation repairs, chimney, anything I could do in two days. So a Saturday, Sunday is what the jobs I would take. Okay. And I was running the business for about six months, making money. You know, I had a few friends. I ended up needing to get payroll workers comp because it just started to grow quickly. And I uh, gave my dad a big stone restoration job. It was like 280 grand. I called him up. I'm like, hey, this is too big for me. I'm in school. Like, if you want this one. And he ended up selling it. And he's like, where'd you get it? And I said, it was on one of those lead platforms. It cost me $27. And he's like, you're kidding. And so that was the kind of the, the start of my confidence of like, hey, if you're not going to make room, but it created enough space where I was like, you know, I enjoy working with my dad, but I, I had also at that time visited a friend in California and I was like, I hate the cold, like hate the cold. And so that was kind of the recipe for why I decided okay. to make the, you know, the trial out, out West. <laughs> I have found over the years, whatever I am doing from a consulting side or explanatory side about this idea of customer acquisition cost. And while yes, it is a very common metric when it's solely based on internet leads and uh, SEO and pay-per-click, this is a metric that exists in every business at every point in time. You are putting forth right hard costs and soft costs to ultimately, how much does it cost to land this customer? I have found... I am very, very poor at explaining this and convincing kind of our clients and friends that this is something that we need to measure, but it's made a huge impact in our own business. What have you found or what ways, if you think about our audience of construction pros, as you think about both online and offline, this idea of customer acquisition cost and its relevance as they look to continue to grow their business? So I, I, I broke into this in two stages, right? For me, I saw what happened during the Great Recession. I remember going to my dad's friends who had $10 million homes and big businesses, and we were buying their equipment. Guys crying, yeah. they're leaving. And my dad's like, hey, we're gonna go help Jim out. He's going through a rough time. We're gonna go buy some new scaffolding. I'm like, what? Like Jim was the guy we used to go to his lake house. You know, Jim was the guy who was like, we're on his boat. And now we're like, it was weird. So that for me, what I set out to do, I didn't have a business background. So I was like, I want customer control. And that's what scared me. And it. My dad had a little bit of this resentment because we would work for these GCs and we'd end up taking projects we didn't want to do, or they beat them up on price a little bit. And there was always this like little bit of resentment with my dad, right? Like, oh, he beat me down, but like we have this other project coming up and we have this and I got to keep the relationship. And I'm like, wouldn't it be nice to have customer control to be able to say no to, you know, this GC and say, look, that's the number. If it doesn't work, we'll fill our calendar other ways. And so I didn't understand customer acquisition. I wanted control of the customer flow. So it started there and that's what's led me into all the marketing and that, you know, SEO, pay-per-click, online, off, all of that stuff. Then when I started spending, you know, when I looked and I was like, I'm spending 30, 50, 70 grand a month, like this went quick. Now I got to understand the input output relationship. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, there's a way it, for me, it was how do I lower the marketing budget? And that's when I backed into customer acquisition cost, And that's when things really shifted for me as a business owner. Did your business subsequently shift away from more GC work when they are the ones building the relationship with the developer or the customer, if you will? And then, you know, they're getting a number from you and they're probably getting multiple bids. Did that mean you shifted away from that work? Because by nature of that, the GC doesn't really want the Mason kind of going up and around to try to meet the developer, the homeowner, whoever that is, right? The builder. Um, how did you approach that or what was the ramification of that? So we diversified. So I remember my grandfather sitting, at, we were at the table and he was explaining to me this concept of how money moves through the economy. I'm like 11 years old. I'll never forget the conversation. And he's explaining that, you know, how the government will invest in bad times. You know, this was his understanding of it. And he was explaining the reason why, and my dad's sitting at the table, why diversifying the business was important mm -hmm. and why we wanted to hold a residential, a commercial, and a government or prevailing wage or industrial wing of the company and being able to shift between the three. And so for us, it was interesting because we had 
and still do, we had all of these verticals. So we had general contractors we worked for that was like commercial. We had residential homeowners or high-end residential, which would be like a general contractor. But it was neat because there were times where we would actually bring the GC's jobs. Like we would get a call and the client would be like, hey, I want to do my driveway, this, this. And we're like, what else do you have going on? And they're like, well, this is stage one of six. And it's like, oh, well, you need a general contractor. So instead of, we would call the GC and be like, hey, we got a job for you. You go in, but we want the masonry and concrete. Yeah. And they're like, all right. So we kind of, you know, we wanted, I looked at how could we control each vertical and have as much influence without having the dependence. And that was the structure for us. Dude, I love that quote, the influence without the dependence. And also the ability to say no or not feel like you're getting beat up on pricing or you're 2% high comes when I brought you over a million dollars with a business last year. I'm looking out for you. You're looking out for me. At the end of the day, we do it right the first time. Everybody wins. The developer, you win, I win. So I love that. If we've got folks that are listening and saying, hey, Matt, sounds great. However, whether it's a product line extension or diversification means you are deliberately starting kind of new territory. We're reallocating resources. We're going to do less of what's made us successful to do this. I don't know. Seems hard. Seems like it's going to be a fight. But if we have people who are interested, what might be maybe the first step or two for folks that really intentionally want to begin to diversify their own customer base? So I looked at it like an R&D lab, research and development lab, because again, I don't have the business background. So I just looked at it like, I'm going to take a small amount of money and a small amount of time each week and continue to push this forward. So I didn't take it as like, I see businesses and they're like, I'm going to open a commercial division. Or I'm going to, I'm like, we never did that, you know, or, or the government side when we started doing it. We were like, okay, step one, who gets the work and how? Mm -hmm. Step two, let's talk to some people and understand it. Step three, let's put a little bit of money and time into this, right? Because that's usually what moves the needle, one or the other, right? Money and investing in people or doing bids. And we, I mean, you're talking about stuff that took place over a five, six, seven year period okay. that we played the long game with. Like I wasn't, I, I very much look at it like research and development. I understand on my PL what amount of money I'm willing to lose each year. And I mean, because for example, we were doing remote estimates for clients three or four years before the pandemic. Right. Like we, that was part of our research and development was, was I was always looking at where the market was going, where I felt I was dependent. For those listening, whenever you feel that frustration, there's usually something really good on the other side of that. And what I mean by that is like, if a GC is like, Hey, can you do, you know, 3% better? And you're frustrated. The root issue for us was we were dependent on that work. And so then I was able to untangle that and figure out what the solution was. So like all of those little frustrations or any area where you're like, oh man, this person didn't show up today. That's on my team or you know, any of those things. There's usually a gold nugget on the other side of that if you start to untangle it. Yeah. What have you learned in terms of being a leader, introducing change when it comes to technology? I'll often talk to leaders and they'll kind of frame it like, hey, we got AI and it's new and it's different. And there's all the stuff going on. And the last two generations we're essentially raised with iPhones and everything's changed. And I will just say technology though, that changes how we work and productivity and forces an older generation to say, what the hell is this? What? Let's just, we've been successful doing it this way. This is a thing that's been happening since whatever, cavemen. So technology in a real broad sense has been happening for a while. However, I do think there's some unique challenges that are taking place on the job site today with the introduction of technology that can have big ramifications, but it's also adding a lot of turmoil. What have you found has been successful when introducing new technology to folks that are in, in the construction industry? This, this is a tough one. So I made the mistake here quite a few times of getting a little bit of shiny object syndrome. Yeah, you made right? both. Yeah. Yeah. And so over introducing things, getting team fatigue, being like, oh, another thing that's going to save the day. So what I learned about two and a half, three years ago was I need to be really selective and I need to take my time with it. Like when we upgraded our CRM or we started doing certain automations or so I think it's this balance of not moving too quickly and just trying to pull everything in and be like, I'm a t we're going to be a tech construction company because that's the wave. So I got away from that, but I was that for a little bit. Um, I thought tech could solve everything. And then on the other side of it, also realizing that if you zoom out far enough and you look at this in the macro picture, that if you don't involve any technology, that at some point, if all your competitors do, 
you know, you're going to be sitting there going, wow. You know, like I think of like the yellow pages or, you know, the blue, the blue book or mm -hmm. back in the day when it was actually the blue pages for businesses. Like yeah. that, I think of those things and I go, there are clearly patterns and trends that do sneak up on us. You know, Kodak is a great example of that. So I try and find the balance and I limit it because sometimes there's a little bit of what I have to leverage that, that a little bit of blind trust or a little bit of kind of trust equity of like, Hey, there's nothing I might be able to tell you right now or show you or graphs or like, there's nothing I can do to really get you to buy into this. Just trust me because all of these other things have been right type of situation. Yeah. And so if I have to rely on that, I want to do that sparingly. And that's where I made my mistake was I was pulling that card, but I was doing it all the time. And then they were like, well, Matt, this didn't work. This didn't work. And I'm like, man, that's a good point. Do you have a recent example of something that passed through your filter and you said, okay, as I look at, and it's on, <laughs> the, when you were talking, I'm like, you are speaking my language. This is very much how I think where I will just dip my toe in the water and I get really excited. And then I want to rush out and I'm like, what am I doing? I've been doing this for six weeks. Why don't we give it six months? Let me be kind of the guinea pig for it before I start pushing something new on my team. That's kind of in a groove right now. Do you have something recently, Matt, where you said, hey, let me give you an example. And we were looking at this for a while and finally we got to the point where we said, okay, it's past this filtering system for Matt DeBara. You are now going to leverage some of that, that trust and that equity that they've given you to say, we're doing this. And, uh, but I need you on board and, uh, and maybe early results or I don't know, kind of going back over the last, I don't know, two or three years, if anything comes to mind. I mean, there's been a few. One was uh, getting a, a communication tool we, we leveraged. So we had the team on, on WhatsApp is okay. how we did it because we couldn't find a good CRM that integrated everything the way we wanted it. And the reason is because we have three verticals like residential, commercial and prevailing wage. And then it, it was a kind of a tricky thing to find that. And so we started with WhatsApp, but then we couldn't, there wasn't an ability to transcribe certain things and search. And so I had to get everybody now over to Slack and change the complete way we were doing things. And every day my foreman take project videos. So like where those videos, like it was a complete overhaul to do this, but I mean, it was a, it was a necessary upgrade mm -hmm. and that's what we had to do. We had to basically leverage the fact that like, you know, it was one of those things where it was sat a the leadership down in a room and we're like, Hey, like, here's all the data. Here's the reason why, here's the issues. But at the end of the day, like, this is where we need to go. And we're not, the, and I always let the team know, I'm like, there's, I, I never pull the, like, you know, I call it the leader of the owner card. Like, I don't think that's a, that's not the way I like to run a company, but there's far and few between where, where it's like, Hey, this is what we need to do. So it's not, we're not going into a room. This is the necessary direction for the company. And so we ended up implementing it and it was dicey for a month and a half, two months, you know, people couldn't use it, cert, like it was caused a lot of issues. But then after that, everybody, we sat down to, and this is important, is the recap after the messy execution and implementation. So three months later, we're sitting in a room, was that better? Oh yeah, this was so much better. This was working great. That's awesome. Okay. Thank you for like trusting me. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, I appreciate it. Like that means a lot. I know that, you know, we couldn't quite connect all the dots because this department only got a small uplift, but I had to go through all these changes. This one got no uplift. These three areas of the business got massive uplift. Like, I just want to thank you all for putting your trust in this decision. Like, and I think that's important is those briefings after it's been done because every single person was like, oh, this was like the best decision we made. Right. And so now they're saying it, not me. Yeah. So is Slack still kind of one of your primary communication tools that really helps you do the daily communication, the videos and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. We use that. Okay. That's cool. Well, I found too, I think early in my career, earlier in my leadership journey, I was not good at this where I was kind of a uh, burn the boats kind of guy. We're there and we ain't going back and I don't care what it takes. And I've realized that's a really stupid thing to do because I'm going to make some bad choices or collectively we will. Retreat is a way to survive. So I will say, listen, if this doesn't work and if I think it's going to need like 90 days, I'll say, Let's give it six months. Let's set expectations. And after six months in one day, we'll have a meeting. We can put it on the calendar right now. And if this shit doesn't work, we will turn around and we will go back. I promise you, because I don't want to make your lives hell. And I, I'm not just doing this for kicks. I honestly believe this work, you know? So have you learned other ways to either improve the way you pivot off something or your communication along the way, just when you're introducing change? 
Yeah, I mean, it's everything you said. I mean, I think for me, it's so natural now. I forget I do it, but it's we establish a criteria for success. We establish some of our concerns. So we'll we'll take everyone's concerns in a room. And we're like, what are you most worried about? In this department, I'm worried about this, this, this. And we put it, we call it the watch list. And we're like, all right, if we're okay. going to do this for four months, these are the things we're going to be watching for every, you know, every week, every two weeks, every three weeks. And we're very open about that. So there's a core framework we use to implement big changes. Very similar to what you said. Very much open communication. We don't sugarcoat things. And then the other part of it is we allow all leaders to do the same thing. So like there's stuff I don't agree with. And the team now will be like, hey, Matt, can you trust me on this one? I'm like, 100%. Or the other thing they'll say is I feel really strongly about this one. And I'm like, okay, what's the criteria for testing? What's our plan if it doesn't work? And how do you, you know, come back with that second phase and we'll meet through it and we'll do it. And so there's been a lot of stuff that the team has implemented that I just can't connect the dots on. Mm -hmm. But I understand that there's plenty of times where they can't do that for me. So I've also learned a lot as a leader in that framework because there's been plenty of things where I'm like, oh, there's no way this is going to work. I just don't see it. But they're like, I feel really strongly. I'm like, okay, great. Well, let's try it. How do we try it? How do we test it? How do we measure it? And how do we move backwards if it doesn't work? Like what's the risk management process? And if they can answer those four questions on almost anything, we'll do it in the company. How do you try it? How do you test it? How do you measure it? And how do you move backwards if it doesn't work? Yep. I like that. That's awesome. I'm just really impressed when you articulate kind of that story where you have built over time or you have developed other leaders that can not only speak truth to power, you as the owner, your name's on the building, but also say, hey, you might not be able to see the vision here. Trust me on that. What have you learned about developing leaders in the construction industry? I mean, so much. I I think my dad used to do this thing, right? Where Let's say there was ever an issue on a job site. We had between three and 10 or 12 people on any job. My dad would do this thing. He'd be like, all right, huddle up. Everyone gets in a huddle. He'd state the problem. All right, so we're out of brick or this happened or this is, you know, weather's coming in. It might rain, right? What do we do? And he would just, and everyone would go around and talk. And it would be quick though. It wouldn't be like, you know, it wasn't like a, this wasn't like a two hour meeting like a corporate. This was like a, you know, we are standing on the job site, yeah. you know, rates coming in. We got to try and decide if we cancel a concrete pour. What do we do? And it astounded me the amount of times that the person making the least amount of money, maybe it was a, you know, a laborer that had been there two months was the one who came up with the idea. I remember there was an issue with uh, scaffolding at a job site. And when the, the company had delivered all of our scaffolding, they mixed two brands and you couldn't, the cross braces weren't the same size and we couldn't get up to the roof. And this, this guy had been working for us for like two months had figured out how to like, because they linked up in terms of like, you could stack them each bay, but they weren't the right, like you had five footers and fours. And so it was like this math equation to get the towers in the right area. <laughs> so we're going back and forth and he's like, Hey, I have an idea. And he went over it. He was like, we'll put two of these here. We'll stack this. That'll get us up 18 feet. And then we'll go over here and do this. And we're like, wait a minute. And we go and measure it. And it was so the amount of times the least paid person or the lowest on the, you know, the rank and file, if you will, was the one who had the idea to solve it. And so we would do those team huddles. So my entire working philosophy is built off of bringing everybody in and just being like, all right, clearly define the problem. And then, you know, it's like, what are we going to do? And I just, that's it. Keep my mouth shut. And I, and I listen. That's such a great example of like leading from anywhere. And often we'll talk about leadership and so I'm like, well, the guys who've been here under three years really need leadership training. And for that example, I'm like, we need the people closest to the action to be able to willingly raise their hand and say, and if I, if I may, let me suggest something. You're like, hell yeah, great. I want as many people thinking as possible. It seems to me, and you, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems to me that you might be someone who's good at small and larger ways, celebrating the wins and the growth and recognizing the people. Do you feel that's a strength? It was a learned strength. I adapted methods based on my, cause my dad, my dad was not that person mm-hmm. in a big way. Not at all. You know, like he was like, good job. I'm like, Hey, we just did a project. You know, we were $200,000 on our budget. Like, you know, like, He's like, like, I know that's what the, that's yeah. why I said, good job. That's what that exactly. was for. Yeah, yeah. He'd be like, I brought you a Gatorade. What do you want? You know, like, like it was like, like it'd be 114 degrees and you'd be working, you know, on a job, all handwork. And what the hell are you complaining about? I came here with Gatorades and I, I brought you you know, she get it, right? So that was the that was the mentality. But I learned that everyone takes appreciation differently. And so we have this uh 
we've rolled it out now and with companies across the country on the on the hiring side with the contractor consultants but it, one thing we do is we get we encourage companies to get company branded poker chips okay so brand your company logo and then we have a company meeting once a month whether it's a breakfast or they stay late or some companies will do a saturday day and on the wheel are different prizes you can win. Little things like a $5 gift card, a $25 gas card. A, one of them is like a pat on the back for a to bar. That was a joke that my team put. <laughs> like, you know, little things, but things that amplify and embellish your culture. One of the little ones is a dollar an hour raise for a year. It's like super tiny. I don't even know what the odds are of getting it. But so we have all these different prizes. And then Throughout the weeks in, in the month, we were giving these chips out to the team for doing things that we recognize as good. And we log what it is and then we celebrate it. It's like, all right, Mike's going to spin. He did, you know, X, Y, Z for this customer. Team walks up, spins the wheel. And, you know, there's meaningful things, a new pair of work boots, like maybe a tool they want. So we, mm -hmm. we pulled the team on like different price points, what they would want. And so we do, I don't know, 30 to 60 of these spins a month. Now, depending on the size of your company and your culture, you can adjust this. This doesn't need to be super expensive. It could be, you know, if you're a small, smaller company with three, four or five people, like it's still work. The concept still is there and we've seen it work in all different, but it's really neat because it gets people who are, are doing well. It, it forces management and leadership to acknowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Cause you're like, wait, we didn't give out any spins this week. Did it, did no one do anything good? And they're like, Oh, it's accountability for leadership. Cause sometimes, you know, that there was a gap depending on the size of your company. It also gets the team to see how you recognize other people and what for. So everybody's now looking and going, oh, if I do this, I could get a spin. Oh, if I do that, I could get a spin. And then, you know, every so often you got somebody who in a month got none and they're kind of sitting there and, you know, maybe somebody's got a gift card or, you know, we have like one of them is like a rubber chicken, which is a funny thing for the company. And so it's like, you know, there's this feeling of like, I want to be a part of this, this achievement. So Celebrating has been a big thing, but it was a learned behavior. Oh, I love that. The reason I ask and the reason I'm, I need to do better. It is not, does not come natural for me. Was it, and probably like you, raised in a family and raised in the work environment where, do you know what the thank you is? You know what the appreciation is? It's the paycheck. You're welcome. And getting out of that mindset, I think not only for myself, but more for the team of letting them know, hey, we're, 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 we're working our asses off. We're trying to do hard things. And uh, to do that, I love that. By the way, I, I just love the casual phrase. You get a spin. You get a spin. Who wants to yeah. get a spin? I want to say that more. So is your spinner digital or do you actually have to make this? Is there a manufacturer so it's, of spinners? It's a little wheel that we got and you put a dry erase marker and you can make different sizes and it's uh, like a, a okay. little three foot wheel. There's digital ones too, but we like to get everyone together and celebrate the whole team. So we'll sponsor like a company breakfast usually. Okay. So come, my mind immediately goes to, is there a way that I can make this ridiculous and super expensive and a lot of fun? So, but once I kind of get going in celebration, I'm like, what happens if we spend $2,000 on this? And they're like, uh, it's free. We, you know, we can get it right there. That's hilarious. So Matt here, maybe as a final question, you've got a couple rows of books beyond there. And just talking to you, my guess is there's a whole other giant pile of books somewhere else. As you think about your own leadership journey, books you've read, movies or documentaries, podcasts you listen to, what comes to mind if someone's like, hey, I want to get better. And a lot of what you shared here was either motivating or inspirational, or it really resonated where they're nodding their heads. What might you recommend something, some sort of piece of content that you learned that helped you grow faster? Does anything come to mind? You know, I think Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey was a, was a good book that helped a lot. Yeah. Um, the concept of being effective versus efficient, mm -hmm. I think is a big distinction in our world because we're always up against timelines and deadlines, but there's also a human component to it. But a lot of it was, I just, I, I just looked at people that I saw and I'm like, did they get the reaction? I look at what people are doing, how people react. And I go, would I have done that? There's a lot of times where I wouldn't have done something a certain way and, but they get the team to do it. And I'm like, oh, that's so neat. Like I never would have been that hard or that direct or that, or maybe even that gentle or that, mm -hmm. you know, open with things and, and the way they did it. So I look a lot at what's working and what's not all across the board. Like I'll go to a Chipotle and I'll look at how the, the, the manager talks to somebody and yeah. like the joke they make. And I'm like, Oh, he made a joke there. And then he asked the person, Hey, by the way, those tortillas I just asked you for, where are they? Like, I'm like, Oh, I see what they did there. So I'm just always looking at what's working yeah. in the dynamic of the workplace. That's how I've done it. Well, I think that phrase just says a lot about your, your leadership style is 
you said how people react. I have kind of learned and kind of go back and forth, but we can always look at leaders. And I think it's easier to look at leaders who are successful and you're just focusing on leaders. Like what do the leaders do? But at the end of the day, the whole act of leadership is followership is what, how do the people react? And I said, when someone leaders doing something more than half the time, it's probably not as useful to look at what they're doing. Look at how people are reacting and they're saying, okay, that did not resonate at all. I can just tell that went over like a turd in a punch bowl that, Let's not do that. However, oh, he just did that subtle little thing that really resonated. So Matt, I think that just says a lot about you and your leadership style. So as we wrap up here, dude, make it really obvious. Don't be humble. If people want to connect with you, just either A, as an individual, uh, I know you do keynotes, you do consulting. Obviously, you guys are experts in concrete and masonry. Make it really obvious to our audience on what the best way to get a hold of you and to learn more about you and kind of what you're doing. So if you want to connect with me directly, LinkedIn, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, probably the easiest way to do it. And then in terms of if there's any hiring struggles or, you know, if they're concerned with hiring, if you're listening and you want to grow your team, the contractor consultants, that's what we do. We've got a subscription monthly way of filling your team that's very different than a recruiter or a staffing agency. So that'd be a, a cool website to check out. Okay. Awesome. We will uh, link to that in the show notes as well. Uh, Matt Tabara, man, I enjoyed this conversation. Appreciate you making time and uh, congrats on all your success. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you. All right, then friends, how did that go? Hopefully you enjoyed my conversation with Mr. Matt Tabara. If you look him up online, he has made this really easy. Just use your little friend Google and you will find all sorts of video articles and information where he shares his expertise. So would strongly encourage you to do that. If you got value from this, please rate and review this on whatever podcast player you are listening to. That means more to us than you know, as we strive to grow our audience, to bring our whole construction community closer together, to help us build safer, more productively, and more profitably. Also, we will be sharing more of Matt's insights that were in the podcast in our construction leadership newsletter. So if you are not on our newsletter list, we put it out twice a month, just twice, and we strive to deliver more insights, make it really easy for you to get inspiration and insights and new ideas to help you become a better leader. You can subscribe very easily by going to bradleyhartmanandco.com, two ends at Hartman, bradleyhartmanandco.com. Scroll to the bottom. You can read past newsletter episodes as well as subscribe. And of course, if you feel for whatever reason we did not deliver on the value, you can always unsubscribe with one click. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to do my damnedest to make sure you never do because I know your time and attention is limited. So we appreciate you putting it here. And with that, my friends, we will close out with our leadership mantra. You, my friend, are owed nothing. Deliver value first. Make it a great week. <laughs>